everyone. We're going to get started. I am so excited to be here today with Dr. Kate O'Neill, the second lecture in our summer speaker series. And um, before I introduce her, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sandra Cannon, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute for Private Training. And just to give you a little background on what we offer here at IPT, we offer customized courses for companies who are looking to help their employees upskill. So if you're looking for any sort of training needs, whether that be business and leadership, all the way to cybersecurity, we are happy to accommodate those needs. We have a highly skilled and trained faculty and staff who are capable of developing customized, tailor-made curriculum for your employees to help them learn whatever skills are necessary. And you're gonna get a little taste of that today with Dr. Kate, and I'll go ahead and introduce her now. Dr. Kate is our Dean of the Business School, and she's gonna be speaking today on conflict and dealing with difficult people. And I love this topic because, you know, no matter whether it's your personal life or in, in the work setting, eventually at least one time in your life you're going to be dealing with a difficult person so it's a highly needed topic to address and i'm excited to learn from her today so to introduce her she is um as i said the dean of the business school and her field of inquiry is leadership and change specializing in strategy and communication she worked in Afghanistan, all over the world, Afghanistan, Japan, Qatar, Guatemala, Argentina, the US, Jamaica, Kuwait, and the Republic of Kiribati. And she is also an industry professional providing services to organizations like the Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi Department of Economic Development, Atisala, and Mombusho. And she, what she does for them is she creates innovative solutions for complex environments on matters related to leadership, change, organization, development, strategy, HR, employee engagement, and cross-cultural, intercultural workplace relations and team development. She has such a vast resume for us to learn from. And she also previously um, led the master of uh, excuse me, sorry, I'm still letting guests in. <laughs> she <laughs> led the Master of Strategic Leadership Program at Mount Mercy University in the US and the EMBA, MSIB, and MMIB programs at Zayed University. And she was just most recently the primary investigator and technical lead for the USAID Advancing Higher Education for Afghanistan's Development Program. And to top that all off, she has a PhD in leadership and change. So she's the perfect speaker for this topic. I'm excited to learn from her and I'll hand the time over to her now. She'll speak for about 30 minutes and at the end, we'll open it up to any questions that you all have about the topic. So Dr. Kate. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. So uh, as you can see, our topic today is conflict, specifically dealing with difficult people. And as was mentioned before, we know that there are lots of sources of conflict in our lives, in the workplace and elsewhere. Language differences, social differences, gender differences, nationality differences, thinking styles, problem solving styles, listening styles. So what I'm gonna to discuss today um, is one small piece of uh, a much larger suite of presentations and subtopics on this issue that we all deal with in our professional and personal lives every day. Day. So uh, I hope by the time we finish today that we're going to accomplish these four things. I'll give you a moment just to look at the slide. And really today I'm going to be focusing on number four, which is some of the strategies that you can use to deal with the difficult people you encounter in your work life or your personal lives. 
So generally, we talk about 10 conflict or difficult personality types. Uh, just about everyone can't fit into one or more of these. Now, why do I say one or more? Because the conflict type that someone demonstrates or we ourselves uh, engage in or exhibit, it varies uh, based on the problem, on the people you're with, and really can vary uh, based on the context. For example, my conflict style in the workplace is different from my conflict style in my personal life and at home. So as we're going through these today, as you're thinking about yourselves and identifying your own conflict style, I encourage you to think about your conflict styles and the different environments, the different types of problems and people when you may exhibit different ones. And of course, with other people in your lives, maybe some people in your lives you know from work, but you also know personally or socially, and they may behave differently in those different situations. So getting right to it, our first one is the tank. And you'll notice at the bottom of each of our slides, I have provided uh, two links that give additional resources about each of the conflict types that we're talking about. Uh, the first one is a website, and the second one is a YouTube video. So I encourage you that when we're done to, uh, to go to these resources, both as a review and to gain additional information. So firstly, you'll see we have on the side of the screen identifiers. So first of all, we need to identify somebody's conflict type before we can choose appropriate strategies for mitigating or overcoming uh, the issues that uh, we encounter with that individual. So the tank. Uh, the tank tends to be a very task-oriented person, somebody who really gets things done. But when things don't go their way, they tend to become angry, pushy, aggressive, hostile, irrational. Right? And they really feel a need to control others, to be right, to, to get their way. Now, I'll tell you, in my personal life, I am quite the tank. And I have learned, as I've studied this topic, how to mitigate my own uh, natural inclinations to being a tank in my personal life. But in the workplace, I'm not a tank at all. Uh, I'm very much a different personality type, conflict type, which we'll get to later. So I want to focus on the first two strategies. Uh, for the sake of time today, I'm not going to talk about every strategy for every conflict type. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on select ones. So first of all, when you encounter a tank, right, you really need to hold your ground to be strong, quiet, resolute, and calm. You want to counteract that energy or that behavior. While the tank is pushing forward with aggression, you want to counter that with stillness, being resolute, being calm. Right? And then you want to interrupt the attack, this restrained counterbalance, as it were. Again, the more emotional a tank becomes, the calmer you want to be. And you really want to shake them out of this emotional state that they're in, because that's really what happens to the tank, is they get highly emotional, highly aggravated. And so they need somebody to help them out of that mindset and to become more focused and rational and calm. One of the ways we can do this, of course, is by repeating somebody's name until we get their attention and then refocusing them on the issue. 
So uh, my husband might say to me, Kate, Kate, Kate. And once he gets my attention, Kate, we were talking about, you know, what we're going to do about uh, one of our children who has a problem. And so really, you know, focusing on uh, problem solving, focusing on the issue at hand so that the conversation and the demeanor goes back to being one of rational discussion, not emotional uh, bulldozing. One of the ways also that you can mitigate or prevent the, the, the tank is by establishing a really respectful relationship. Tanks always respond much faster, much better, and tend not to go into tank mode with people with whom they have a pre-existing, deeply respectful relationship. I'm gonna move on to number two now, which is the sniper, right? And again, you can identify the sniper because they make those quick, sarcastic, sneaky, under their breath comments. They tend to roll their eyes, right? And again, they're called the sniper because they're stealthy, they're sneaky, they're covert. So what are some successfully proven strategies to deal with snipers? Well, the first one is the stop, the look, and the backtrack. Uh, let's say you're in a meeting and a sniper, uh, one of your colleagues, makes a comment under their breath. Rather than continue with your thought, a successful strategy can be to stop what you're saying and expose the sniper. And you can do it professionally and politely. But remember, the sniper wants to remain hidden. So calling them out, uh, publicizing the behavior is going to stop that. So for example, oh, um, Sam, uh, I'm sorry, did you say something you'd like to share with all of us? I didn't hear what you said, if they make a comment under their breath. Or Tom, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Could you please repeat that? Um, I think people were listening to me and didn't hear you. Uh, perhaps you might say, um, oh, Susan, um, what exactly did you mean by that? Could, could you explain more specifically what you meant? So these are ways to politely and to professionally expose or bring out into the light, as it were, to make public the covert or hidden behavior that the sniper thrives on. So uh, that is, and, and number two says use searchlight questions. Searchlight questions are what sometimes we call probing questions. What did you mean by that? Can you explain that? Oh, when you said this, what did you mean? What was your intention? What's the impact gonna be? How is this related to the topic we're discussing? Okay, I'd like to move on to the next one here. I know I'm going through these a bit quickly. Um, I'm gonna focus here on, on the, the overall view so that we have plenty of time for questions at the end. So number three is the know-it-all. The know-it-all sometimes called the, the bulldozer. And know-it-alls in this case actually really do know what they're talking about. They tend to be experts in what they are saying. But given that they have no doubt when they say something and they're not really open to correction. Uh, they can be condescending to people. They might, when something goes wrong, they might blame people who they consider to be less competent. And they can uh, inadvertently humiliate or embarrass people. So these are some of the ways you can identify the know-it-all. So how do you deal with somebody who is truly a know-it-all, a specialist, an expert in the topic on which they're speaking, but they're doing it in such a way to create conflict and maybe engage in a bullying type behavior. Well, the first thing is be prepared and know your stuff. If you're gonna uh, discuss a topic of expertise with a know-it-all, come in armed with your data, your facts, your references, 
do your homework before you get engaged in the conversation, knowing that this person probably does know as much, if not more than you on the topic. Then the backtracking respectfully. Again, these probing questions, you know, present your questions in such a way that shows respect for the know-it-all's knowledge. Present yourself as if you wanna learn more. That's really interesting. Can you tell me more about this? Oh, I don't know about this. Can you explain how it connects to what we're talking about? Oh, that's a really interesting suggestion, but I'm not sure how it relates to uh, the larger problem. Could you explain that to me? Know-it-alls tend to respond very positively to that, an ability to share their knowledge. So, um, and again, ways you can say, I was one, we're, Phrases like, I was wondering, where it's like, perhaps. The, the last thing is when you deal with know-it-alls, they can eventually open up, but it does take them time to think about and consider. So you may want to politely present an idea, like, I was wondering if we might consider this option. Perhaps this might be, an avenue worth investigating or pursuing. Leave it like that and then come back to the know-it-all later. And you might find that after they've had some time to think about your ideas, to integrate them with what they already know, that they're open and maybe even embracing and championing the idea that you're proposing. But it's important to, to be respectful, uh, to be somewhat tentative, and to, to make sure that the know-it-all feels respected and that uh, you defer to that expertise and knowledge. Now, counter to the know-it-all is the they think they know it all or the pseudo expert. Sometimes these folks are called balloons because they're full of hot air and no substance. So how can you identify the think they know it all, the pseudo expert from the actual expert. Well, they tend to have a very superficial understanding of a topic. They tend to exaggerate or overgeneralize using, you know, oh, well, everyone, all the time, it's always, everyone knows, it's, it's a fact, without giving any substance or specifics. And the think they know it all, the pseudo expert, it's really an attention seeking behavior. These are people who really want validation. They want the respect, they want the admiration, perhaps they want the power that the true expert has, but that at this moment in time, or perhaps ever, they're not able to achieve. So understand what motivates them. One of the things that we can do is you can give the person a little bit of attention for other things. So if they're trying to talk about a topic on which they have no expertise and you happen to know they're wrong, focus on something that they are good at, something that they do know. This will calm them down. It will make them feel more secure and mitigate the need to have these attention-seeking, externally validating behaviors. The other thing to do is, of course, when you discuss with them, do it in private. Again, they are looking for external validation. They're looking for respect and attention from the group. And so they're very, very sensitive to anything that can make them feel less than devalued, embarrassed, Okay, so moving on here now is the grenade, right? And the grenades sometimes are called exploders. And I think we can all understand why. How do you identify the grenade? Well, they really do. They go, they're suddenly out of control. They might have what we call an adult temper tantrum. There's frustration and rage but it comes out of nowhere. It seemingly just appears upon us. 
And that is the grenade. The grenade is somebody who builds up their anxiety, their resentment, their tension for a very, very long time. And then eventually they explode. So there's two strategies for dealing with the grenade. The first is the short term, the immediate. You're in a room and the person explodes. So very similar to what we spoke about uh, earlier is you want to get the person's attention. You want to shake them out of the reverie of the headspace of the reality that they're in and get them back to joining our common reality. Um, so again, saying their name, uh, you know, gently, but, but with, with force um, to get their attention. Um, being sympathetic, this is what we mean by aiming for the heart. Meaning, remember, these are folks who this resentment, this angst, this anger tends to be building up over quite a while. And so this is very much an emotional reaction. Uh, maybe this is the person who has been uh, working overtime and weekends and taking on extra projects for weeks at a time with no recognition. and then suddenly somebody criticizes their work. That can cause them to explode. So have sympathy for the conditions, the situation that brought them to this point of exploding. Uh, and then reduce the intensity. Again, getting their attention, focusing on the emotion, and then bringing it back to the topic at hand. So you can see where the grenade and the tank differ in this. And there is prevention. You know, find out what are the triggers for the grenade and then contain those, mitigate those, try and prevent those. Going back to our example, if this is somebody who has been working a lot of overtime, taking on extra projects, not getting recognition for them, right? Then, you know, we know that overwork, stress, uh, exhaustion might be a trigger for this particular employee or coworker or friend. And so we're sensitive to that. And, and if we're in a position to help them overcome that before they get to the exploding situation, then the grenade could be prevented. The yes person. So the yes person is a people pleaser and they want to avoid conflict. And the yes person is the individual who says yes to everything with the honest intention of actually doing everything that they agree to when fully well, it's not possible. This is a person who overcommits and, as I said, truly does want to do everything they agree to, truly wants to contribute, but simply doesn't have the skills to say no when they should. So these, this is really the way that we can help the yes person. We can help the yes person by making it safe for them to be honest and say, I'm overloaded. I'm overwhelmed, I can't take on something else or I've taken too much and I need to take some things off my plate. And we can give them that permission to, to say no. Uh, and this is really key, I think, with a lot of managers and supervisors when they identify a yes person is reinforcing that it's okay to say no because as managers, as coworkers, as partners and friends, Right? When somebody commits, we count on them to complete it. And when they're unable to do that, bigger problems happen. So it's much easier for everyone involved if they're able to say no before they make that commitment. Following is the maybe person. Uh, the maybe person is sometimes called the indecisive or the staller. Now, this is a person who really truly just can't make a decision. They want to make a decision. They're trying to make a decision. They're quite earnest about their willingness. 
they just don't necessarily have the skill to make a commitment to a project, to an answer, to a solution, to an initiative. And so um, one of the things we can do is create a safe zone where they can commit. Uh, sometimes the reason they won't make a commitment is because they're nervous they're gonna disappoint people or they feel that there is an absolute with certitude right or wrong answer and they don't wanna make the wrong answer because they're afraid of hurting the company, of hurting their friends, of um, negatively impacting people with their decision. This is actually one of the easiest um, personality types, conflict types to help by giving people some decision-making skills, rubrics, frameworks, uh, this really can help the, the maybe person overcome uh, this conflict type in a pretty fast and permanent way. Now, the next person, the nothing person, might be confused for the maybe person, but their motivations are very different. Whereas the maybe person genuinely and truly wants to make a decision, but lacks the skills to be able to do it or the confidence to be able to do it. The nothing person does not want to make a decision at all. Sometimes they're called the clam or the stonewaller. This is a person who does not want to be involved in any decision-making. And so, they ignore, they avoid, they don't acknowledge questions uh, or comments or requests. And there's some very specific and well-known ways to deal with the nothing person. One is when you're communicating with them, when they need to be involved in a decision or a discussion, have ample time because there's gonna be a lot of silence involved there's going to be a lot of delays. The nothing person has learned to outweigh everybody else. So you need to create enough time that you can outweigh them. Also, ask them very specific open-ended questions. Who, what, where, when, how, why. Ask them questions that they cannot avoid, they cannot ignore, they cannot generalize or brush off. And after you've asked the question, whether it's face-to-face -face or in writing, say email, you need to force a response by waiting. Wait them out. Let them become uncomfortable with the silence and the delay. Because remember, one of their key strategies is they have learned to outweigh other people. They know many people are uncomfortable with silence. So they just have to wait until you become uncomfortable enough that you either leave, decide, or get out of the room. Uh, and um, you can also guess. Sometimes you say, oh, I would guess this is what you want to do in this situation. Well, you guess it wrong and they're gonna correct you. So they're gonna start answering, they're gonna start getting involved, they're gonna start having opinions. Or you could show them the future. Well, this is what's gonna happen if we don't have this information from you. These are the problems that are gonna be caused if you don't contribute your ideas. These are the ways our competition is gonna supersede us or we may go out of business if we don't have everybody contributing. And then lastly, um, email. I find email to be a really great way to communicate with the nothing person. There's a record, you can follow up, you can share it with other people. And so there can be some social pressure put on them as well. So we're getting towards the end here. It's not our very last one. It's our second to last one. And this is the no person. So Unlike the nothing person who just won't contribute, won't engage, won't participate, they ignore you, the no person, they're very much involved. They give you a response and it is a hard negative, a hard no. 
These people often in conversations, in discussions, they're cynical, they're disagreeable, they dismiss other people's ideas, and they're just focused on obstacles and futility. So two uh, of the strategies I've personally found very, um, very, very helpful is the polarity response. Uh, and that is to um, see if what they're saying actually has merit. If they're, find out the, the merit of the negatives that they are proposing and discussing. Frequently, when a no person has their negative acknowledged and explored, then they then feel free enough, they feel heard that sometimes they'll move beyond no. That they'll say, okay, you know, we, we've, we've discussed reality, now we can you know, go into hypotheticals. And that can get them out of, at least momentarily, but the no person is generally a no person in every aspect of their life. And you're not going to change who their personality is, but you might be able to leverage their good intentions and their, their no intentions generally really are good. They don't want us to make mistakes, to waste money, to make bad decisions. So we explore, we examine, we acknowledge, and then hopefully then they will feel free to go on a hypothetical positive journey with us. And then lastly, um, I think universally the whiner is the most universally disliked of the conflict personality types. And I think the whiner says it all. The, the person who is always helpless and hopeless and uh, really seems to like misery. There are a couple very uh, key strategies for dealing with the whiner. Focus on solutions. Don't get pulled into their negativity. Don't try and talk them out of the helplessness and the false sense of despair. Focus on facts, focus on action, focus on solutions. Also drawing the line with them, setting limits. Okay, we spent enough time talking about everything that's wrong. Now let's focus on what's going well. And I can't repeat enough, do not sympathize or empathize with, with, with the whiner. Do not get drawn into their emotional void. Uh, because that's really what they're, they're looking for. Misery loves company. But by the same token, we don't want to shame or blame. We really want to try and take the conversation out of the emotional and keep it focused on action and fact. I do, before we move to questions, want to acknowledge that the work I've discussed today comes from this uh, very popular and well-known book, Dealing with People You Can't Stand, by Drs. Brinkman and Kirshner. So if you're looking for something to read, uh, I highly recommend this book. It's an easy read. It's a quick read. Although it is full of really great, proven uh, social psychology information, it is not written as an academic or a medical text. It's really written for uh, you and me and the everyday worker, the everyday manager, the non-expert in the field who just wants to know how to have less conflict in their life. Thank you, Dr. K. All right, so now we'll open up time for any questions. I could see myself in several of those examples <laughs> in how I react to things. So it's helpful also to see from the reverse side all of that, how to how to deal with that. So and maybe use some of those techniques to calm myself down <laughs> in intense scenarios. All right, would anyone like to ask any questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself or 
Um, you can pop it in the chat if you don't want to be on the camera. Do we have a bunch of nothing people here? You're just waiting, <laughs> waiting us out? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right. I'll give it another minute. <laughs> Don't be a maybe person, decide to ask the question or the comment, or if you have something to, to share with us, please. Uh, we, we've all experienced this, so I think we all have a lot to learn from each other. And we got a lot of thank yous in the chat, Dr. K. All right. Mm -hmm. I think you just presented it so well that we don't have questions. <laughs> so um, Marcy says, how would you advise someone who complains about someone else's behavior? That is a great question. I, um, again, I think one of the first things I would do is identify <clears throat> um, what the, the cause of the complaint is. Um, is the, the cause of the complaint actually the behavior of the other person or the person who is, is complaining uh, about the other person? And this is actually a really broad topic because there are so many different hidden and invisible sources of conflict. Uh, interpersonal conflict, uh, both personally and professionally. For example, differences in listening styles. So that would be one of the key things um, is, is to identify what that source is. If we're talking specifically here, these, these difficult people things, um, then again, if we can uh, note patterns of behavior over and over, then it's much easier when we're either speaking with the individual or speaking with our supervisor or speaking with HR, uh, rather than again, giving things that are vague or general. If we can see specific patterns of behavior, then we have the data, we have the facts, the evidence, the information to determine the best way to intervene. Um, it's a great question and I love it. And it is a question that I um, will spend uh, 16 weeks at a doctoral level class talking about and teaching. So I hope my uh, 90 second answer was sufficient. Maybe we'll have you come back and give a lecture on just that. But um, we have another question. They said, as far as I have understood from the slides, the points you made are about the weaknesses and strengths of an employee. The question is, what are the strengths and weaknesses um, come almost in all, or what are your strengths and weaknesses come almost in all job interviews? Do you have any recommendations of how to answer these questions? Well, um, I do, uh, but again, it depends whether I'm coming from the perspective of an HR professional, which is a large part of my practitioner consulting background. Uh, the way I would answer it wearing my HR hat is very different than the way I would answer that question as a job seeker and a job applicant myself. So, um, Maybe uh, for how, maybe you could tell us, are, are you asking as a job seeker or are you asking as the HR interviewer? As a job seeker. Um, so one of the things really is to focus on the key points in the job description. Of course, always when you're interviewing, you want to ensure that every answer 
ties back to the job itself, even if the interviewer has not framed the question in that way. For example, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Uh, if I were answering that question, applying for the dean job, I would say, well, as a dean, the strengths that I bring to the job are my experience, having been a dean several times before in a variety of programs in different countries, including here in the Gulf region. Uh, time management and organization is incredibly important. So I would tie my answers back specifically to the requirements of the job. As far as weaknesses, I tend to frame it in well, I have experience in budgeting, but I have to say it's the area where I feel least confident, although I have been doing budgeting successfully uh, at the dean level for over 15 years. I also end interviews uh, by saying, you know, when as a euro, you usually end an interview by asking the person being interviewed, do you have any questions? And uh, I almost always end it with saying, um, one, why are you interested in me? What about my application uh, interested you to speak with me? And then two, what I call my closer, is after our discussion today, do you have any concerns or worries about um, hiring me for this position? I'd like to uh, address them now if I could. Great examples. Thank you, Dr. Kim. All right, any other questions? I have a question. If you're managing a team, Dr. K, and you're trying to identify these things in the team that you're managing, what's the best way to kind of track that? Or do you journal that? Is that weird to do as a, as a supervisor? Or what's the best way to kind of keep track of different styles of behavior so that you can, you can work well with, with these different types? I create an Excel sheet. I create a spreadsheet where I will put the names of everyone on one side and the conflict types. And every time I witness something or hear of something, I'll tick, you know, the right box. And then after a while, if I see that, you know, Samira is, you know, has 10 conflict incidents and nine of them are tanks, I feel pretty secure that Samira is a tank. Okay. Um, and, you know, yeah, so that's personally, personally what I do. Um, Okay. I'll, I'll just follow up on that though. I do that not just for conflict type, I do that for listening style, which is a huge source of conflict. Uh, I do that for decision making style, for um, thinking processing style. And it's a way for me to have real clarity about who the people are that I'm working with and that I'm supervising in it allows me to serve them better. If I understand how they think, how they work, then I can, um, I have a better chance of giving them what they need so that they can succeed in their job role. Definitely. I love that because that you will be interacting throughout your career with so many different types that it, you have to learn how to adapt and have to, how to serve these people in your supervisor capacity. So that's excellent. Any other last questions before we close? All right, thank you so much everyone for joining us today for the second speaker series lecture. We have one more with Dr. Mazin that will take place next week. So um, if you'd like to join us there, you can still sign up for that on our website at aiu.edu.kw slash IPT. You can also sign up for free consultations there if you would like to uh, consider doing any training for your employees at your company. 
So feel free to visit our website for those two things. And thank you, Dr. Kate, for imparting your knowledge with us and helping us learn a little bit how to deal with difficult people. Thank Have you for inviting me, everyone. Thank you.